briefing has started. All right, our next presentation is Reading Between the Lines, Finding and Giving Voice to Sexual Minorities. Here is Mindy Pugh. I can share. All right, can everybody see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> I'm so okay. Excited. Okay. And I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're very oh, welcome. Good. Wonderful. Yay. Okay. I feel more secure having you work it through than me. Well, hello, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you, um, the vast uh, bulk of you remaining through to the end of the afternoon on this Friday. Um, delightful uh, experience, and thanks to all the other presenters and whatnot. So, uh, yes, I'm Mindy Pugh. Uh, I've been in the archival field for, oh gosh, over 30 years, I guess, and um, uh, and um, wear a couple hats in my life. I've uh, been an archivist, like I say, for my main bread and butter for, for quite a while, but I've also um, gained advanced training in history uh, and at IIT, where I currently am and will probably retire from. Uh, I've been an adjunct professor for a dozen years, uh, which has given me a chance to uh, really delve deeper into uh, my historical training and my perspectives and uh, whatnot. Um, most of my work at IIT in terms of adjunct teaching is in Chicago history, um, based upon the first 23 years of my archival career, which was at the uh, CHS, CHM. Uh, so shout out to those of you who are there. I see uh, Bianca is uh, here, of course, Gretchen and, and others as well. Um, and uh, that's where I really uh, cut my teeth in Chicago history. And that's now a continuing uh, advocation of mine. Um, yeah, uh, I, this talk here is going to be kind of more subject uh, based. It's going to hopefully give you some perspectives and some tools uh, as archivists, uh, as you look at your collections, either what's there or in terms of collection development uh, in relative to the issue of LGBTQ. Uh, what's there that you might have overlooked before? Uh, what are some strategies for moving forward if you indeed want to document that uh, aspect of the human experience more? Um, and um, so, yes, uh, it's, I'm not going to have a tight agenda. Uh, I'm going to uh, weave back and forth between um, perspectives, anecdotes, uh, and uh, some lessons learned along the way in terms of terms of this issue that uh, I can speak to. Uh, I am on the spectrum myself, uh, rather a late transitioner, but uh, it is never too late if it's something that you've discovered about yourself. So uh, I have the additional, I guess, freedom uh, to speak. Um, in the sense of, um, you know, uh, hopefully I don't have to police myself too heavily uh, uh, on some of the issues here. So uh, that's my uh, my basic introduction. Um, yes, to, to mention a little bit further, uh, I had been at the Chicago History Museum now, CHM, for, for about 23 years. I uh, was very, very privileged to work uh, alongside of the late, great uh, Archibald, Archie Motley III, uh, who uh, was uh, very much an urban individual. Uh, the first I'd really worked with closely, I came from northern Michigan, a rather backward uh, area north of the, of the 45th parallel. But coming to the city of Chicago for graduate school and working with Archie, who was um, uh, biracial, uh, and he was a very progressive individual. Uh, the uh, Archie Motley um, Fellowship, of course, is named for him in terms of trying to promote uh, minority uh, increase in participation in the archives field. Uh, and so I took many trips around town uh, with him and field working to minority communities and also sexual minorities. He was very alive to diversifying collections at the um, at what I would consistently call it the CHM. Uh, very uh, broad collecting scope looking for disadvantaged voices or underrepresented voices. Uh, and so not only were we collecting uh, some of the great African-American collections that are now uh, at CHM, but uh, he was a very uh, the head of the, the, the curve when it came to documenting LGBTQ. Uh, 
um, the Greg Sprague uh, papers, which are at CHM, uh, were brought in. Uh, he was the uh, the field worker, and I was, you know, the, the grunt who uh, helped load the boxes into the car and whatnot. Uh, Greg Sprague uh, was a amateur historian, uh, PhD candidate at Loyola, I believe, uh, gay uh, activist, a leather man, uh, and uh, he died in 1977, uh, 87, sorry, during the AIDS crisis. And uh, uh, one thing that is really great about field work and very anchoring about field work is especially if someone has just passed away and the partner has given you a call uh, and said come on you know greg wanted you to have his papers and you come into a broom uh, a home uh, where the individual had just been living a few weeks before and has just passed away uh, to take those things off of the shelves or out of the file drawers and to uh, transport them to to the museum or to the repository um, uh, Gretchen, I don't know whether my name is on the Greg Sprague inventory. If it's not, um, I'm not concerned. Uh, but I did the initial um, kind of crude inventory of the Sprague materials. And, and going through the uh, Sprague materials um, uh, was my first really in-depth exposure uh, to LGBTQ issues. Uh, and uh, so it was just one of those happenstance things. Uh, in your life as you move forward, where uh, I was very privileged to to go through that, I think around 40 box collection. Oh, oh Gretchen, also, I do want to publicly thank you um, in front of everyone here uh, that um, a few weeks after my transition and coming back to work, I received an email from Gretchen uh, who said, oh, I've heard you've, this has occurred in your life, uh, and would you like to have your inventories renamed or given your proper name? And uh, I said, yes, your, your, your name of choice, your, your, your true name. And so I said, yes. So um, what I want to say um, in connection with that, Gretchen, is, and to the rest of you, is uh, cataloging is not just about minutia and about Excel charts or all the, the multitude of databases and whatnot. It's, it's having a social awareness, having a social conscience. And uh, I was very amazed by you know, Gretchen reaching out to me that quickly because um, I was actually not being very proactive in letting people know initially. So applause to Gretchen for, for doing that. Okay, uh, that's my sort of overview starting on in, and uh, uh, we'll go to the, the next slide. Okay, there's all sorts of, like I say, kind of principles in this very interesting and, and multifaceted and uh, um, this varied field of, of gender and sexuality studies. Um, and uh, one thing I wanted to put up front and put on one of these early slides is um, in terms of archival needs or historical documentation, uh, for people on the spectrum, LGBTQ+, um, oftentimes their, their evidence is either hidden away or it's hidden in what I consider plain view, but both kind of hidden oftentimes, especially in you know, the world before 30 or 40 years ago. Um, on the left, there's a photograph that some of you might recognize. It's taken from a volume called Casa Susana, uh, which is based upon a um, scrapbook or series of scrapbooks that were, I believe, found uh, in a, um, you know, garage sale or something like that. Uh, it turns out it's a series of uh, photographs of young men, cross-dressing men, uh, who went to this upstate New York uh, uh, place business, but but confidential. It wasn't advertising, but people on the spectrum knew about it, and the transgender or at least the cross-dressing spectrum knew about it. That this is a place where you could go uh, and dress and have take photographs of each other give each other support and whatnot. And uh, and so there were not just Casa Susana, but other places very similar to this, where um, the refuge, places to be yourself, or at least a part of yourself, uh, it, without judgment, where you could gain um, support and socialization from others and, you know, fashion tips and whatever. This obviously is very, you know, um, late 50s, early 60s in terms of this particular volume that's being uh, documented here. 
So that's what I would call hidden history, pretty much hidden away, um, because a number of these young gentlemen might have been married or dating or whatnot. They didn't want people to know that this was, you know, part of who they were at whatever level. Um, and so there was something that had to be uh, kept secret. Um, the other concept, hidden in plain view, is one of my own sort of concepts, uh, where you have people who also are dealing with some sort of spectrum issue, um, gender, uh, identity or um, sexual orientation, but who've chosen for whatever reason not to to uh, publicly you know, affirm it, especially again in the sort of older decades. Um, to the right, you have one of the great gospel singers uh, in U.S. history, Clara Ward, who was actually not not a Chicagoan but uh, from Philadelphia, uh, and she uh, her family uh, was were prominent. Uh, singers, gospel singers, um, and they traveled the country. Uh, and her mother had actually founded the group, and they were called the, the Ward Family Singers. But Clara was by far the most dynamic voice. And most people who know the history of gospel will put her like right next to Mahalia Jackson in terms of, of her skill. Um, she uh, was a very strong performer, uh, died young, died at the age of 48 in the early 1970s. Uh, and uh, her recordings are out there, and I'd recommend you take a listen to to her performances. But um, many decades later, uh, one of her sisters, um, uh, Will Award, um, probably around the year 2010, published her own autobiography talking about that family's singing and career and, and whatnot. And it was the sister who revealed, oh, oh by the way, Clara was bisexual. Um, we would go to... Um, performances or uh, concerts and there was one episode or a couple of episodes where um, people on the spectrum approached Clara uh, quite openly uh, about uh, sexuality and you know maybe we could meet up later or whatnot and um, Willis said that Clara was quite embarrassed to be outed in front of a younger sister and whatnot but um, and there was no discussion of it later but it became quite clear to the younger sister that uh, her older sister, the famous one in the group, was indeed bisexual and was was active uh, in that, but not publicly. But why do I still call that hidden in plain view? Uh, because unlike the girls or the uh, the trans or the um, transvestites at Casa Susana who are truly trying to block themselves off from view except to one another, uh, some people on the spectrum, uh, I'm going to say. Um, are benefit or use their their anxieties and their in, insights and their creativity that's oftentimes very anchored in in their own identity their own sort of challenged identity to go out and to uh, project and to perform and be dynamic um air quotes flamboyant um and i would allege that some of these great performers were especially great uh, because they needed uh, to reveal themselves, sometimes in a sort of um, shaded or oblique way, but they still needed to perform. They needed to to reveal uh, in some sort of oblique way uh, their insights and their identities. Uh, sorry, I'm being a little prolix here, but uh, it's what I feel. Uh, and Clara Ward, to my mind, really did uh, do that. I'll touch more on that later in the presentation. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And yeah, now I'm going to um, do a little bit of a historical run through uh, of history of, of um, gender presentation and gender dynamic in the in the United States uh, relative to um, LGBTQ issues. Uh, I do this for you for for a sort of benefit if you do want to become more sensitive to these issues as you work your collections and, and work as professional archivists. Uh, and when, for me as a professor uh, who also teaches on LGBTQ issues, what are some of the major touch points of that evolution? Um, and it, it starts largely uh, in the 1850s. Um, Susan Stryker, who's also a trans woman, uh, is a professor of gender studies, I believe in one of the California universities, is um, in uh, a book on transgender history that's really quite 
quite great and um, it's been influential to me. Uh, but she has a chart on one of the pages about a lot of the major cities of the United States in the early 1850s that adopted anti-cross-dressing ordinances. Um, she speculates that uh, as cities were uh, skyrocketing, skyrocketing in terms of population in the mid 19th century, um, and Chicago, of course, was a leader of that huge growth of urban presence in this country just before the Civil War, that um, many people were coming together in aggregates and, and coming into communities that were becoming increasingly uh, large and capable of sheltering people who were a little bit off the beaten path in terms of identity. A little bit, you know, the uh, you could either go west or you could go into a big city to have requisite uh, anonymity uh, and protection for an alternate identity. So, uh, but a number of the cities responded to that. They, um, in terms of the official leadership, the puritanical official leadership in those cities, they were uncomfortable with this. Um, they alleged it was sometimes an issue of keeping law in order, uh, but a number of those cities, Chicago included, uh, did adopt anti-cross-dressing ordinances. Um, and it's, so this starts the sort of official record in, in the North and in urban history of, of the recognition of gender and identity issues in terms of how accepted should they be by the mainstream uh, or how much they should be policed or a mixture of both. Um, as the Civil War came out long after that, uh, of course, uh, the Civil War uh, pushed all other issues to the side, uh, understandably so. And a lot of those um, anti-cross-dressing ordinances were not enforced during the war. And it was interesting that um, some of you might know from your, your knowledge of this uh, that uh, many women used the opportunity of the war uh, to um, to enlist and to get out of their uh, their households and whatnot and to go serve. On the left, you have a photograph of uh, Jenny Hodges, uh, who was known as Albert Cashier. She's an Illinoisan, downstate, I believe, and um, she um, presented and passed su uh, successfully um, and uh, served out through the war and uh, received. Uh, benefits as a veteran uh, for about 50 years after that. Uh, she was only uh, outed at the very end of her life when she was in her 80s when she had to go into a medical facility and a forced exam uh, revealed that she had been a uh, born woman or was a genetic uh, woman. Um, but um, her story is not super atypical. There are quite a number of women who who uh, went into the army uh, or into the other services during the war. Um, it's, uh, and this is where it's debatable. It's one of these gray areas. And I'm going to start off this presentation talking about a lot of gray areas that um, debatable about, was this an opportunity to, accept, uh, to express a true gender identity? Or is this just simply a, a need to um, break out of social bounds and to feel freer uh, than most women uh, could feel at this point uh, in society at that point, to go out and to have some adventures and to fight for the union and whatnot. So, um, yeah, that's sort of a you know, overlapping and gray areas of these this area of study. Okay, next slide. Um, as we try to get into this subject in terms of publishing and documentation, um, again, these are some cautions to, to lay out as we look for materials or we try to do exhibits on materials and whatnot. On the left is an image that was um, printed or given online recently in, in, uh, on the site uh, affiliated with one of the East Coast newspapers um, documenting people on the spectrum back in history. Uh, and they use this photograph, not married, but willing to be. Now, from our present perspective, this is kind of exciting because we think, oh, gosh, we can actually go back into the 19th century and find some photographs of some young uh, gay men who are who are partnering, uh, even if secretly. Well, be cautious uh, about that, because these also could be just a couple guys who are uh, fishing uh, homosexual uh, 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 heteronormative guys who are just looking for uh, 
for gals and for wives and whatnot. So um, I'm not quite sure what that represents. Uh, there are various things to be cautious, cautionary about uh, so that we don't engage in uh, what historians call presentism, trying to impose our awarenesses or our agendas too much upon the historical record. On the right is a, a photograph from the Chicago Daily News archives, which is at the uh, CHM, and it shows a, a young woman who had been arrested in 1909 uh, for uh, cross-dressing, and so that 1851 law is still on the books. Now, again, is she LGBTQ? Is she actually a lesbian uh, or, or, uh, or not a trans man, uh, somebody, a female, born female, assigned female who wants to assert a, a male identity, or was she just simply uh, a straight woman who, again, wanted the freedom that uh, uh, most women would not have otherwise to, to go out and to um, break some barriers, as it were, without actually asserting a, a different ad identity. So these are things to be aware of. Next slide. Uh, that same issue of presentism dogs the debate over whether Jane Addams on the right, uh, Associate Mary Rose Smith were actually lesbian lovers, or were they just, were they just conventional, very well-bounded, uh, bonded Victorian era virtual sisters uh, functioning in a gender segregated society? So again, things um, to keep in mind as we as you try to uh, sort through uh, this very complicated field of of discourse. Next slide. And now a segue into uh, into fashion, um, which kind of complements uh, all of this, because uh, obviously dressing is part of either masking or projecting identity, either one or the other. Um, in the 1870s through the 1890s, the feminine ideal uh, was to be corseted and uh, very hourglass. And on the left, you have a portrait of uh, Lillian Russell, one of the great uh, stage actresses of the time. And with that being the female uh, model, it was quite easy uh, for female impersonators to simply put on a corset uh, and, and pass. And so if you had a gender identity uh, rebellion going on, the, the corseting of the time um, would permit you to make that, that crossover. So uh, women could cross over, as Jenny Hodges did during the Civil War by wearing the more loosely fitting clothes of the, the male soldier, uh, but um, males could cross over by simply putting on the corset and, uh, um, you know, presenting that sort of look. So uh, at a time when in the 19th century, when the efforts to maintain gender uh, segregation were so intense, ironically, they provided avenues for stutterfuge for those who wanted to transgress against those boundaries. Next slide. And um, in the previous slide, uh, on the right side was uh, Julian Elting, a, a female impersonator. He never made any uh, secret of the fact that he was a heteronormative male, had a wife, I believe, um, but um, he was just as big of a box office draw as Houdini, uh, because both he and Houdini uh, demonstrated that these social barriers or these barriers of presentation or gender barriers uh, were just challenges if you knew how to creatively manipulate them and break them. Um, so uh, Houdini um, dealt in the illusions of escaping from, uh, you know, physical restraint. Uh, but uh, Julian Eltinge demonstrated, you know, how you could break some of these other sort of more cultural barriers. And in a progressed, a very repressed era, they were showing pathways uh, for rebels who would come after them. Again, they were entertainers. They weren't trying to um, upend society. They were just trying to, you know, gain box office and, and impress people in terms of their skill sets. Uh, but you could look at Houdini as kind of a um, sort of a paradigm for the future gay men who were moved into what was called the sort of muscle culture, muscle men. Uh, uh, culture of the 40s and 50s. And for many people, Julian Elton is an, ex, um, an inspiration not just for um, cross-dressers and uh, gender performers, but also for trans women. Next slide. Uh, 
And yeah, um, this theme of using fashion continues. Uh, as some of you might know, in the 1920s, women finally won the right to vote. Uh, they also um, engaged in the flapper culture, which ditched the corset and emphasized straight lines and flatness uh, in order to um, help liberate themselves from the previous, uh, you know, bounds of, of gender segregation. Uh, but uh, what, what do the, the, the cross-dressing men do? Well, many of them are capable of following right along. Uh, as I playfully put here, many men can do flat chests and straight lines too. Um, moral of the story, nothing is permanent or elemental in gender expression. It's so, so much of it is social construct. Next slide. So with all this confusion, all these gray areas between people on the spectrum and people not on the spectrum who are just simply manipulating uh, this, you know, these styles of presentation for entertainment or whatnot, uh, what's a conscientious archivist to do? Um, well, don't give up on it. Uh, be careful, but don't give up on it. Uh, there are strategies to, to reflect on this topic. First off, learn more about the overall LGBTQ history. It's fascinating. Uh, and it's only, um, like I say, only 150, 160 years in terms of um, studies, uh, subject areas of study that will get into this. So there's not a huge uh, swath the period to to really deal with in terms of the urban experience where so much of this has been developed. Um, and then from the 1920s onward, there's been a more of a sort of overt and honest coming out of, of uh, people on the spectrum. Next slide. Um, yeah, by after the 1920s, which of course were very liberating for men, but it, they were also very liberating for for, for women, sorry, but also very liberating for men in a different sort of way. Um, uh, increasingly, um, men uh, who, are, who are gay are increasingly uh, feeling free to engage in public display of same-sex attraction. Um, and um, they follow a different sort of path where they, they're, they now emphasize their, their masculinity, uh, but it's very clear it's a masculinity of a sort of shared uh, bonding and eroticism. Uh, and then after World War II, you get a different layer added to that with the rise of the muscle man. Uh, so as I put, again, playfully, darn good chance these, these guys are gay. Next slide. And then uh, secondly, um, always know that you can turn to group histories and biographies. Uh, that are quite helpful in providing direct and circumstantial evidence uh, when dealing with um, people on the spectrum before 1920. Uh, again, look for uh, information on particular fraternities, sororities, churches, theater groups, etc., which were known meeting places for individuals who were later quite openly LGBTQ+. And then it's safe to say that others in the same groups were more likely to have been on the spectrum. Next slide. Um, Lewis Institute was one of the uh, two schools that combined in 1940 to become IIT. So it's one of the predecessor schools uh, of IIT. And uh, I've discovered that there were various sororities at Lewis Institute, which were real kind of hotbeds of, 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 uh, of lesbian bonding and, um, and uh, professional association. A number of the sororities at uh, Lewis Institute were um, uh, headed by Marie Blanca, uh, in the in the front center, uh, who um, nurtured um, female bonding and, and career development and and uh, um, same sex eroticism. A uh, number of very uh, famous or semi famous literary figures came out of Lewis Institute uh, under the um, mentorship of Jane of, uh, of Marie Blanca, and then went on to uh, you know semi prominence or prominence in literary fields. Um, Jane Heap, who uh, was one of these Lewis graduates and who had come through this sorority, uh, became the paramour of um, Margaret Anderson, who was, the, um, who was also a lesbian and who founded the very famous literary review in Chicago, which uh, was one of the very important engines of publishing early modernist uh, authors in the 1920s and 30s uh, and poets and whatnot, Ezra Pound and people of that, that sort. So. Um, this comes out of that sort of a, 
uh, sorority and group dynamic. Not all the young women who are in this sorority were necessarily on the spectrum, but there's a critical mass going on here that is interesting for and learning about, you know, uh, individuals and groups involved in, um, in this culture. Next slide. On the left, you've got uh, uh, Jane Heap, who uh, increasingly you know, went in this sort of butch direction. And on the right, you have her seated with Margaret uh, Anderson, who kept more of the sort of femme presentation. Next slide. And okay, getting back to uh, Clara Ward. Um, second slide, uh, where I was talking about how she was outed many decades after her death by her sister Willa. Um, and uh, Clara is in this circa 1945 photo, the, the figure at the top. Uh, and her sister Willa is to the right, to her left. Uh, and it was Willa who wrote the book uh, later. And when I have uh, put here as a quote from a recent piece of scholarship, uh, well, maybe not that recent, but still important and path breaking. John Howard's uh, Men Like That, A Southern Queer History, where he makes this argument, which I fully endorse and pass on to you, which is that, um, and I'll read this and then comment. This hearsay evidence, inadmissible in court, unacceptable to some historians, is essential to the recuperation of queer histories. The age-old squelching of our words and desires can be replicated over time when we adhere to ill-suited and unbending standards of historical methodology. This is a liberating um, piece of advice. Uh, in the archival field, we try to be very exact and very exacting. We, we research our copyright uh, um, permissions and whatnot. We don't want to step out of legal boundaries. We don't want to allege things beyond what is truly documented. And as uh, John Howard indicates, sometimes we hold ourselves to courtroom standards. But when you're dealing with um, communities, whether LGBTQ or African-American, there, give yourself that added license to maybe don't make any overt mistakes, don't engage in presentism, but do allow yourself to to maybe go with some of those um, uh, additional uh, areas of information, secondhand testimony from a sibling or other people in a group, where at least you can potentially discover more of a network of, of community and then use good judgment, but stretch the boundaries a little bit. Um, the whole, uh, at the very top, I put um, uh, the whole music workshop, workshop uh, see, gospel music workshop of America uh, title, uh, which was a, a, a black gospel organization active in the mid 20th century, where a number of gospel performers would get together and practice music and perform and and trade stories and information about performance and publishing and whatnot in the gospel field. Uh, but it also became known as really kind of a trysting and uh, meeting point for people on the spectrum uh, to love each other more openly and to engage in liaisons and whatnot. And so it became also known playfully as the Gay Men and Women of America organization. And indeed, some of Clara Ward's trysts were at conventions of the GMWA. Uh, Next slide. Um, we're pushing time a little bit, so I'm going to skip over this one. Thanks, Julie. Um, oh yeah, here's uh, one of my, I had to throw this in. Um, one of my, I, I, the previous slide, I talked just quickly about the importance of groups increasingly uh, a little bit of my own activist thing, groups on the spectrum being more uh, honest about their identities and to work to uh, demand a place in the public sphere and not to be ashamed because hiding is not very productive strategy. You know, it, it, it's dangerous and it, it, it promotes retrograde social development. Um, but uh, having said that, there's still obviously a role for, for uh, famous female impersonators and whatnot. This is just one who has is, is been my favorite along the way. He uh, did arrange before his death for his papers to end up at uh, UNLV. So next slide. 
Okay, and my final couple slides are going to deal with uh, a collection of materials at IIT Archives uh, that I came across a few years ago. I was delighted to find going through the yearbooks and then finding some actual prints within the collections that uh, IIT between 1945 and 1955 um, had a, a male burlesque uh, club that called itself Rough Castings, which is really kind of delightful because a lot of these guys were engineers and so they were, you know, mechan um, uh, metals engineers and whatnot. So uh, talking about Rough Castings when it's a male burlesque group is is, is very cute, you know, it's a reference to their fields and it's a reference to, you know, the sort of obvious maleness that they were bringing to these female uh, presentations or female appearing presentations. Uh, and um, uh, next slide. And here are a couple stills uh, from presentations and, and theater productions done by rough castings. Uh, and my parting thought on this, and this will be the last uh, slide, is that, um, again, this goes more toward what I was just saying uh, a minute back about be a bit more progressive uh, or a bit more, you know, take a little bit of a leap uh, in terms of trying to reassert or, or rediscover uh, some of this material uh, that's just simply buried under social convention. Um, no doubt I'm willing to allow that most of the performers in this group um, joined because of a love of performance. Uh, in the military in uh, World War II, and a lot of these guys had been in the military in World War II, they were first uh, introduced to uh, cross-dressing uh, and um, burlesque performances in the Navy uh, because it was an all-male environment and and for the fun of it they they felt liberated to some of them to dress as women and to engage in these plays and whatnot that were well received and it gave a number of them a taste of performance and the taste for um, that level of personal expression uh, but by the same token the fact that many of those veterans had been put into same-sex dynamics and environments during that war many of them discovered that they were gay many of them discovered that maybe they were transgender and uh, I think it's not unfair to realize that many of them coming back to college after World War II, taking advantage of the GI Bill and whatnot, um, that they continued for some years, while it was still socially acceptable, to run these burlesque shows. Some of them probably did have gender issues, and therefore I, I see it as an LGBTQ resource as well. Okay, I kind of, get, kind of stumbled over myself a bit to get this all in. Uh, but that's my medley of, of um, awarenesses that I have come across thinking about archival issues in connection with uh, this area, of course, very personal interest to myself as well. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? It's terrific. Thank you. I I, I really... I'm taking to heart your comments about presentism and about not sort of imposing what you think something is saying on what it might really be saying. So that's uh, something that I'm definitely going to. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, in one sense, do be careful of presentism. Don't make crazy leaps or, or, or sort of embarrassing leaps. <laughs> but on the other hand, creatively do look for the, 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 uh, counter narrative or the repressed narrative or the hidden narrative that is there and creatively try to bring it out. All right, I see we do have a, a question here. Do you have thoughts about trying to research specific geographical areas like LGBTQ plus history in a certain neighborhood? Uh, yes, yeah. And um, of course, IIT is on the south side uh, and uh, so many of the great um, Burlesques uh, were on the South Side, both white and African American. Um, a lot of great. I decided not to to include it, and I wanted to keep under 20 slides. Uh, but uh, Jet Magazine, which was one of the um, very cool Chicago-based uh, magazines on Black culture, uh, published uh, literary pieces, but also was great for photographic documentation. 
the Jet Magazine in the early 1950s had um, semi-frequent spreads from the cross-dressing balls that were held on the south side. Uh, Finney's Ball and whatnot, 55th and State and whatnot, not too far from IIT. So many of those cross-dressing balls occurred around Halloween because that was a social cover that uh, um, black men could dress like Lena Horne or, uh, you know, black Marilyn Monroe's or, or black, uh, you know, Joan Crawford's and whatnot. Uh, and just say, well, it's a Hollywood, uh, it's a Holly, uh, you know, Halloween costume or whatnot. So um, hopefully on that night, it'd be much less likely that the police would come and, and raid them or throw them into the paddy wagon or whatnot. Uh, but people knew what was going on. These these were guys who really definitely enjoyed that, whether for um, erotic or identity issues. But yeah, this was their chance to really trot that out at Halloween under the cover of that, that uh, season. So yeah, um, the near south side is a great place for this. And so yeah, it's an area I do want to, to do more research in and, and perhaps uh, contribute to. Great, do we have any other questions from the audience? Would anybody like to unmute and ask or type it into the chat box? All right. Well, thank okay, you so well, we much. Got it, got it to four. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, everybody, for your presentations. This has been wonderful. Stop recording.